My name is Sandeep Patala. I'm a senior program associate with the Environmental Change and Security Program here at the, at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. The Environmental Change and Security Program, also known as ECSP, is 18 years old and we look at the various connections between health, environment, livelihoods, population, and security. ECSP is now part of a larger umbrella or uh, program here at the Woodrow Wilson Center entitled the Global Sustainability and Resilience Program. Today's program is brought to you today by our HELPS project, and HELP ironically stands for those words I said earlier, which are health, environment, livelihoods, population, and security. That's a five-year effort generously funded by the Office of Population and Reproductive Health at USAID. As many of you know, the Wilson Center is the formal memorial to our 28th president, the only president thus far to have achieved a PhD. And here at the center, we aim to bring the worlds of policy, practice, and academia together to better inform one another. You have the speaker's bios in front of you, so now I just want to direct your attention to them. We will first be hearing from our moderator, Lori Mazur, who's a consultant here at ECSP, and also a uh, editor of a pivotal moment, Population Justice and Environmental Challenge, and the Environmental Challenge, excuse me. We'll then hear from Dr. Betty Amaro, who's a professor emeritus at Florida International University. Then we will hear from Dr. Elizabeth Malone, who's a senior research scientist, uh, Joint Global <coughs> Change Research Institute. And lastly, we'll hear from Roger Mark D'Souza, Vice President of Research and Director of the Climate Program at Population Action International. Um, just a quick note about today's program before I do turn it over to, to Lori. It is being webcast live. Um, what that means for you today here in the room is that when we do come to the Q&A portion of today's meeting, I'd ask that you use a mic so that our colleagues who are tuning in on the web will be able to hear you. And please do introduce your yourself you, with your name and your affiliation. And other than that, I think I'm ready to turn it over to Lori. Thank you for joining us today. <laughs> Technologically challenged. Thank you so much for, for braving, braving the weather and coming out today. It's great to see all the interest in this topic. Uh, so when Superstorm Sandy hit the East Coast last fall, I think it was something of a teachable moment for a lot of people about our increasing vulnerability to disaster. Um, and there have been a lot of those moments lately. Uh, the number of people affected by natural disasters skyrocketed over the last s century from uh, just a few million in 1900 to something like 300 million in 2011. And uh, of course, some of that increase is due to better reporting. Uh, some of it simply reflects the growth of the human enterprise. There are a lot more of us, uh, and collectively we have more to lose than we did a century ago. Um, but it's also, of course, a result of human-induced climate change, which is projected to grow much worse over the course of this century. Um, and climate change is causing both fast-moving disasters, such as hurricanes, as well as slower-moving crises, uh, such as droughts and food shortages. Um, and the, the increase in natural disasters is also a result of, of the damage that we've done to the natural environment. For example, uh, the loss of mangroves worldwide has uh, increased coastal, coastal communities' uh, vulnerability to storm surges. And of course, natural disasters are not all that we have to worry about. Uh, today, we're, we're connected as never before by dense global networks of, of commerce and information. This is a map of human mobility patterns, which has been used to, to ac accurately predict the spread of epidemics. Um, so in this hyper-connected world, everything moves very quickly, whether it's <coughs> diseases or, or financial crises. Uh, so the, the scale and the impact of disasters today uh, can be greater than anything we have previously experienced. 
So the, the proliferation of disasters has gotten a lot of people talking about resilience, you know, about how we can lessen our risk and how we can recover more quickly from disasters of, of all kinds. But often the conversation focuses on how we can harden our defenses, how we can uh, build stronger levees or, or higher seawalls. Um, and what often gets missed in that conversation are the social dimensions of resilience. And it's social factors like access to resources and strong community ties that, that can literally mean the difference between life and death in a disaster situation. And so that is the focus of our panel today. Um, I'm going to give a very quick overview that cannot possibly do justice to the uh, vast body of research on this topic. Um, and then Betty is going to look at this I issue through the lens of social justice, um, looking at the ways that uh, distribution of resources and other factors can have profound impacts on vulnerability and resilience. And then uh, Elizabeth is going to drill down and I explore one particular aspect of social resi resilience. Uh, the way in which women's ability to make their own decisions about childbearing can affect their ability to adapt to climate change. And then finally, Roger Mark is going to give us some practical examples from his own work of projects that are taking a, a holistic approach to cultivating social resilience. So what is resilience? Um, in the simplest terms, we can define it as a system's ability to mitigate and withstand disturbance and bounce back afterwards while continuing to function. Um, and as I said, there's been a huge amount of research on resilience in both the natural and social sciences. And uh, interestingly, there's a lot of overlap between the two. Uh, resilient systems, whether natural or human-made, share a lot of <coughs> characteristics. Uh, for example, diversity. Uh, a system with diverse components will have many reactions to a disturbance, um, so it's unlikely to go belly up all at once. Uh, and that's why a healthy forest on the left is more resilient than uh, the tree farm on the right. Uh, and this is true for human systems as well, and is one reason why uh, San Francisco, with its very diverse economy, is in better shape than Detroit. <clears throat> um, healthy resource reserves can also make a big difference. Uh, and natural resources, such as mangroves and forests, uh, can buffer the impact of storms and prevent fl flooding. And financial resources also make a big difference. Uh, that's one reason why the Japanese were able to get back on their feet pretty quickly after the devastating earthquake and tsunami that, that hit them in 2011. Uh, this photo was taken a few days after the, after the quake. However, uh, and this is very important, money isn't everything. Uh, this is Auburn Gresham, which is a, a poor, mostly African-American neighborhood on, on the south side of Chicago. And in <coughs> 1995, Chicago suffered a, a terrible heat wave that killed more than 700 people. And the mortality rates were highest in poor African-American neighborhoods. Uh, but Auburn Gresham was a, a shining example, uh, a shining exception to that rule, uh, with mortality rates that were actually uh, quite a bit lower than in uh, affluent, uh, predominantly white neighborhoods. And that's because Auburn Gresham is rich in social capital. Uh, these are members of, of one of Auburn Gresham's youth groups. Uh, now, for an individual, social capital is about our relationships, uh, ties to, to family and friends and, and colleagues. And in communities, social capital is, can be measured by, by levels of trust, by the strength of, of social networks, and by the quality of leadership. So what that means in a place like Auburn Gresham is neighbors looking out for each other. It means people going and knocking on doors and checking on the, the sick and the elderly, um, which saved people's lives during the heat wave. So another important element of social resilience is agency. Um, and agency is about people's capacity to, to make choices and enact them in the world. 
Uh, resilient people have a sense of control over their destiny. Uh, resilient communities involve their citizens in, in decision making. Um, and fundamentally, agency is really about power. Uh, it's about personal power and political power. Uh, and in a resilient society, power isn't concentrated at the top, it's distributed broadly. So empowering people who are marginalized in a society isn't just the right thing to do, it's also the smart and resilient thing to do because capable, empowered people are able to cope with all kinds of crises from job loss to tsunamis. Um, so there's much, much more that could be said about the characteristics of resilient systems. Uh, for example, inclusive governance is very important and uh, so is innovation. Uh, and I, I know that my co-panelists are gonna touch on a lot of other things as well. Uh, but I'll leave you with just one thought. Um, you know, as, as I've gotten to understand this issue more, it's become really clear to me that a society that was designed for resilience would look very different than the one we now inhabit. Um, right now, the, the natural reserves that could protect us from disaster are being destroyed. And poverty and discrimination is limiting individual agency and also collective action. Um, and inequality, I think, is, is depleting social capital by uh, weakening the bonds of trust that, that hold communities <coughs> together. So to answer my own question, uh, we, we're not ready. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it's important to keep in mind that humans are nothing if not resilient. You know, over the millennia, we have rebounded from plagues and famines and all manner of disasters. And the, the lessons of those exper experiences are part of us. You know, they're, they're encoded in our immune systems, in our bodies, uh, and in our most enduring social structures. Um, so resilience is in us, and it's something that we can cultivate in, our, in ourselves, in our families, uh, in our communities. And it's my hope that the, the teachable moments of the future will encourage us to, to build societies that reinforce rather than undermine our native resilience. Thank you. Laurie, for that good, uh, good introduction. S sets the stage very well. Um, I was asked today to talk about um, resiliency from a social justice point of view. And basically, I think the big question is, is uh, safety and security a, a basic human right, or are some people more worthy of it than others? And uh, that's a philosophical question that we're not going to answer here, but maybe we can at least um, look at some of the issue, things that would have to happen uh, for that to occur. Assuming this will do it. Yes. Um, <clears throat> basically, these are the topics, and you're not, and you're familiar with these topics. Uh, it's just I want to give some examples from a pretty e eclectic um, a career that I've had um, that maybe will uh, highlight some of these issues as we talk about them. <clears throat> yes, the resiliency has many definitions, but they all, almost always start with this idea of the ability to absorb and then recover. And in physical resi resiliency, I think bridges are a perfect example of that. And of course, I wanted to use this beautiful photograph I got last week from Laurie Peake um, to sh I thought was a good example. Um, and bridges are built to, you know, to, to give and to move um, and then come back to their original position. And, and that's basically what we're talking about. And it's used in lots and lots of fields. In, a, in one of my former careers, I remembered in textiles studying that wool, one of the characteristics of wool, that wool fiber is the ability, is its resilience, the idea that when it's crushed, it will come back to its natural um, natural stage. So it's very easy for us to um, understand this from a physical point of view. But when we start talking about social resiliency, now we're getting into something that's far more complicated. Uh, after all, people are involved. <laughs> and um, and far, a um, lot, lot more to it than just the ability to, to come back. 
It has to do with being ready. It has to do with adaptability, tenacity, um, our commitment to survive. And there's, a lot, I think, I can come up with some good examples of that. And the willingness of, of communities to actually rally around a common cause and a shared set of values. Um, I was in, um, in New Jersey and New York just recently on um, looking at the, you know, this, the things that were happening with Sandy with the recovery and so forth. And it's very clear that this whole issue of some communities being committed to restoring themselves uh, may, is making a big difference in the, in the speed of the recovery. It's just one of the factors. Um, looking at it just from the hazard point of view, since that's most of my career has been studying um, um, hazards and particularly hurricanes. Um, and <clears throat> just recently, I've been working with the National Weather Service um, on a project related to storm surge. And I'd like to use that as an example here of uh, things that you need, people need in order to be able to be resilient to a hazard. First of all, they have to understand the hazard. And one of the first things we found out is people do not understand storm surge. They just don't. Uh, they think of it as slow rising water. They think of it as something you can get away from at the last minute. Um, otherwise, why would people stay, such as the people who stayed on the Mississippi coast in Katrina? We didn't hear a lot about it, that because of the tragedy that was going on in New Orleans. But uh, Mississippi, when that storm surge came in, as predicted, like 20 to 24 feet of storm surge, there were, uh, there were 100, almost 200 people caught in its path who died immediately. And you wonder, what were they thinking? Clearly, they didn't understand the hazard, nor did they understand their own risk, their own chance of it happening to them. So those two things, it's, it's per perfectly clear. <clears throat> um, and again, looking at the, uh, the first thing, do they understand storm surge? This is a survey we did not too long ago, um, looking at co coastal public, people who live on the coast, and asking them, what do you think kills the most people in hurricanes? And here are the answers they gave. They used to probably would have given wind, but there's been a, a lot of publicity about inland flooding, especially after Katrina and so forth. So they felt that more people died from, from flooding from it, rain, than wind, and then water from the ocean, which in fact, water from the ocean kills the most people. So uh, people clearly do not understand storm surge. Um, and people don't understand their risk. This is very interesting because th these are people that we knew where they lived. And they, we knew the ones in red are ones which are ones who are, in fact, exposed. They're surge exposed. And look at this, how many say it's not very likely they'd ever be affected by surge. Isn't that amazing? You know, they live on the coast, yeah. uh, but just for whatever reason, uh, just think it applies to somebody else. Um, the next thing is understanding, even if you understand the hazard and you understand, yes, I may get hit, do you, do you understand what you can do to get away? What you can do to save yourself? In the case of surge, you've got to evacuate. There's really no other way. Um, and then you have to, where? Where do I go? Um, and so forth. And you have to have the resources and flexibility to respond. And you, I can think of no better example <clears throat> of the lack of those last two things been here. These are some of the, the horrible pictures we saw after Hurricane Katrina. Um, clearly these people didn't evacuate. Why didn't they? They're, I'm sure that, and we know from studying it, there's a lot of reasons. But one of them had to do with just not having the resources. Now, we knew that 100,000 people, from the census before Katrina, there were 100,000 people living in New Orleans without transportation. That was public knowledge. And yet, there was no public transportation provided for them. Um, the way they have struggled is just pretty amazing. You realize this guy has one, one leg is missing. And I keep thinking, how'd they get him up? How did they get the holes in the roof, get him up there on top of the roof? I mean, you talk about uh, a social network. I mean, he would be dead if he didn't have that social network. It's pretty clear. Um, uh, here's a father and a son trying to protect their dog and maybe a few little possessions. Here we have people who, it's interesting how people will bring out their flag, you know, in moments like this. You know, here we are, we, are, we belong to this country, you know, please help us. Um, so clearly this is an example of people who didn't have the resources. Another fact, a couple other factors. Another factor was that these people, New Orleans was the most place-bound city in the country. People had lived there for generations and not, go, not lived anywhere else. And there were large networks of people who, who, who were there. So they didn't, it isn't as though they had friends and family someplace outside of Louisiana or someplace outside of New Orleans that they'd go to their house. They didn't have those connections. Many had never been out of New Orleans. So it would be a scary thing, to, even if you had a car, to get it and head to nowhere when you don't know where you're going. It would be very frightening. 
um, even if you had the cash, the gas, the car, all the resources it would take. The other issue is uh, there were many cases where these extended families may have had a car, but there wasn't room for everyone to go. And so nobody was going to leave somebody behind. Same thing, elderly people who refused to go. So the whole family stayed. You know, because grandma says, you know, we're okay in Camille, she's not going anywhere, so none of us are going anywhere. So there are a lot of reasons why uh, people didn't make the right choice and, and paid a horrible price for it. Um, looking at social vulnerability for a minute, uh, which, you know, we talk about social resilience, so now let's talk about, from the other point of view, what does make people vulnerable. First of all, their unequal exposure to risk. And we know that there's, a, there's, a, there's inequity in the exposure. For example, more, people, more poor people live in floodplains than anyone else. Now, you have a lot of rich people living on the coast, you know, but you also have people who are working poor, who are working in the hotels, working in the, if they can afford to live anywhere in that area, it's usually in poor housing, such as mobile homes and so forth. Um, <clears throat> so some of the people who are vulnerable are people in manufactured housing, people, and this is a, these are pictures after Andrew. Uh, this, this is a family who's lost their home. You can see their entire uh, park was, uh, was destroyed and the little girl's holding on to her kitten. Um, minorities. This, this is a woman who was standing in line at FIU where they had the, the line where you could get food and, uh, and here she's picked up diapers for her little girl. And um, this is after Andrew. Minorities we know suffered more after Andrew. Renters. Definitely. Renters have very little, um, they have very little control over the mitigation of the property. You know, they typically don't, aren't the ones that decide whether you put up shutters or not, and that kind of thing. And they are, uh, very often the landlords don't um, re rebuild the places very quickly, you know, for insurance reasons, or maybe they're trying to sell it, or, but over and over we find that the people who have the slowest time recovering are the renters. They're the last ones to come back to New Orleans if they ever get back, you know, because they didn't have uh, uh, the resources. Uh, this man is lowering some of his belongings, you know, down the wall. Um, another group, of course, are the elderly. This is probably the most iconic picture of Andrew. You probably have seen it. It won a Pulitzer Prize. This is a man at a mobile home that went in trying to find out, see what he could find, and all he found was a pair of pants for left from his trailer. Incredible picture, isn't it? Um, <clears throat> I've already mentioned that adequate resources, <clears throat> the economic resources, the money to mitigate, to evacuate, to recover. Insurance is another big issue. And when we were studying after Andrew, I live in, in the Kendall area, and we would go down, drive to Homestead to the tent cities every day with our grad students and so forth to, <clears throat> to interview people. And to do that, we'd cut through a community called South Miami Heights, if any of you know Miami. It was um, small homes, homeowners, um, many of the working class people who got in their first house. And they were modest houses, but it was a nice community. And we'd drive through there every day, and we started realizing nothing's happening. These houses aren't getting built back. And you notice, you know, often after hurricanes, people write the name of their insurance company on the side of the house, you know, just to, to say, hey, Allstate, get over here. Well, when you drive through there, it would be things like Brown or McCory. I mean, places, insurance companies you'd never heard of. And so what we, we did find out when we studied the community, we decided to come back and study it, is that they really, there had been redlining. The big companies had not sold insurance to these homeowners. And so their companies went bankrupt and they didn't have insurance. Contractors took advantage of them. Um, it was a minority community. It was about a third uh, Hispanic, about a third African American, and about a third other. Um, and uh, they truly had been taken advantage of. We heard story after story of contractors taking the money and not coming back to do the work. Um, and of course, I think the health and physical ability and education are perfect examples. But this is, this is what, um, as I say, South Miami Heights were homeowners, working class people, uh, we first talked to them a year after Andrew. Uh, they had many difficulties then, all kinds of problems. We went back 10 years later. 10 years later, we talked to them again, 10 years after Andrew. And of those that we found in, in, in their house, the majority was still not back to normal. 90% reported moderate or major long-term effects on the families. We had suicides, we had heart attacks, um, just all kinds, strokes, all kinds of things that the family members attributed, at least in part, to what they'd had to be gone through. Uh, and many renters now, before it was homeowners, many of these houses now are being rented. Very uneven recovery. This is what the house, many of the houses look like. There'd be a house that was perfectly completed and repaired, and right next door would be this. 
or an empty lot, or people living in a house. We, this is inside. People are living in these houses. This was the, the ceiling of one we, we recorded. This one, the same thing. This was a family that was back, but look, 10 years later. Mm. And um, Laura mentioned social resources. Um, the social networks and connections are so incredibly important. And now I'll give a positive example. This is, uh, maybe some of you have heard of this, after Katrina, the Vietnamese community in New Orleans was a very, um, a very tight community. I think they had about 900 people, I think someone told me. Um, they had, they had, um, they grazed the, the floating gardens uh, for crops and sold those at the markets. They had restaurants, um, and all of them belonged, or pretty much all, belonged to the same Catholic church. And this father um, actually kept in touch with him, them. I was there like three months after Katrina, and I ate in one of the restaurants that was already up and running again. And at that time, when we talked to him, he said he was in contact with 400 families, that he, wherever they had gone to, and so he was getting them back as quickly as he could, and, and he did it. He did it. I mean, it was amazing uh, how many of them had got back so quickly, 90% by one year, which is pretty unheard of, but it was that tight social network of resources helping each other and so forth that did it. So they were lucky to have had that. Um, a res now let's look at it more from the macro up point. A resilient society obviously plans for growth and development. I'm going to show you after Hurricane Charlie. Here's manufactured housing. We still have lots and lots and lots of them in Florida, even though we know this is what happens with tornadoes, with hurricanes, you know, whatever. Um, and this was um, in, in Port Charlotte. In contrast, this home was actually at ground zero where Hurricane Charlie made landfall at the mouth of the Peace River, set out on the point. All he has lost is some tile off the roof and screening from off the pool. But this house was built later, um, and it was built by the new building codes that were put in effect after Andrews. So they have made a difference. Um, <clears throat> it also, you know, it was a fairly expensive house. It had been well built. That whole community did very well. Now looking at Sandy, I'm looking at it from a different point of view. <clears throat> I'm going to talk a minute here about dunes. This is Ocean City. They had a dune system. And you can see it didn't work, did it? <laughs> These houses were covered with sand, I mean, way up, all the way back there. Uh, but you can see where it just eroded right through the dunes. In contrast, I visited this community of Avalon, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Avalon is, a, um, is an expensive, there's no question about it. It's been, and in fact, it's been so gentrified that uh, the mayor was telling me they don't have enough children to keep their school system because older people with money are buying up all the houses. Um, but the thing I wanted to comment about, they have a terrific dune system. These, these faint lines you see, those are just pathways. This is good vegetation. There's big setbacks from the water. They weren't touched. Those houses there had absolutely, you saw no damage whatsoever. So it does make a difference. But they'd been working, according to the mayor, they'd been working for 20 years on that dune system and with federal money. Well, you think, okay, why couldn't this one have had federal money? Maybe they weren't as organized. You know, whatever, whatever happened. And you can see they didn't have the setbacks when they built their houses where these definitely, this is a, these are big setbacks. Um, pretty amazing. Addresses chronic po poverty and promotes social equality. Uh, but getting to the issue of social justice. Let me just, some of you have seen this probably. This was a, a study that was done in, I think, uh, 2011. But first they asked um, uh, Americans, if you, if you divided the 20%, 20%, the, you know, the U.S. population in fifths, and you distribute the wealth, what would be ideal? Well, we're, we're a country that, you know, we do believe that, that working hard and, and various things can, you know, not everybody's going to be equal. So people said, yeah, to me, you know, the, this, these people up here have a little more of the nation's wealth, this 20%, ideally. And then they said, well, what do you think it's like? And this is what people said. Well, this is, in reality, I know we're not there. We're, you know, the top 20% probably has about half or a little more of the, of the wealth. We're not getting wealth here. Then they showed them the actual. Wow. We are well on our way to becoming a developing nation. Am I right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. <coughs> uh, looking at in terms of income. Uh, this study was done uh, more, more recently, yeah, about the same time, I think. Let's see. This was in the Huffington Post. It's a study that the UN um, Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean um, it got, got the statistics from the Statistical Yearbook. 
This is looking at taking <coughs> the top 50, uh, top 20 percent of popular of the excuse me of the income, dividing it by the lowest, and then for the, getting these numbers. The larger the number, the greater the inequality. Isn't it pretty amazing that the United States is here? Above we have Uruguay, Venezuela, El Salvador, Peru, Ecuador, Mexico, Nicaragua, Chile, and Argentina, and Costa Rica are all have less inequality than we do in this country. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. So it also addresses chronic health issues. Now, I won't go into these three. Pretty obvious. Let's hope that we're going to get move toward more universal health coverage, uh, connects families with the community, and protects the environment. I think I've spoken a little bit about those. In basic, a, a friend of mine, Don Geis, who's an architect and urban planner, says, hey, it's a quality of life issue. The better, the more equality we have, the better we're all going to be. The better, sort of what Lori said. Um, it makes for resiliency as a nation. Um, looking at from a sustainability point of view, I thought I like this. This shows the, really the three, this Venn diagram shows that that common issue, there's social, social justice, environmental protection, and economic growth. That those three things where they intersect, we have sustainability. And I thought that was an interesting uh, way to look at it. Conclusions, the community resilience and sustainability are certainly tied to how we use our resources, how they are distributed. Inequality has increased in the U.S., continues to increase, thus the safety has decreased for large segments of our population. And a social justice perception questions this um, from a moral standpoint as well as a practical one. Is this really what the way we think communities should be built and the nation should be? And you probably heard this quote by John, by John Rawls, um, that a just society is one in which any rational agent situated behind a veil of ignorance would choose, knowing that he or she could actually be located in any position within that society. In other words, if we could choose where we, what society we were born into, um, not knowing what position we would have in that society, would we choose the United States? It gives us something to think about. Thank you. I am hesitant now to uh, follow these two great presentations with lovely sets of pictures. I have no pictures. I'll warn you up front. <laughs> uh, my, I come to resilience through a um, long-term study of climate change, the social dimensions of climate change, and vulnerability assessment. Uh, and it seemed to us at uh, a point in time in our, in our study of vulnerability that it would be better to study resilience. Uh, it would be better to study the strengths that communities have, that societies have. Um, it would be better to uh, think about building those strengths rather than to uh, continually look at vulnerability, which is, after all, a deficit concept, right? This tells you what's wrong with you, um, than it is uh, to, to look at a society from the viewpoint of how well could it respond, not how poorly might it respond, but how well could a society respond to the kinds of changes that climate change will bring. And climate change is an interesting problem because it has both a disaster, right, so a, a short-term kind of uh, increase or in intensity or frequency of very visible events, and it has a very slow onset uh, kind of change that really uh, has the potential to literally take the ground from under us uh, in, what, in what we do and how we relate to our ecosystems and our climate. So uh, what I've been trying to do is to, to raise this issue within the climate change community which has typically, for 20, 30 years, been using uh, the, a usual set of population scenarios without, without much thought. So it has been using projections of the major international uh, UN 
pro projection scenarios or uh, projection scenarios from the IASA in, uh, in Austria uh, or one of the established, and, and, and doing it really sort of thoughtlessly, um, not with an eye towards well, what might change a population scenario and how would a changed population scenario impact a society's ability to deal with and respond to climate change? And so that's the, that's the question that we've been looking at. So I want to talk about a little experiment that we did using uh, two models that have been used in climate change research and trying to ask the question, uh, about what difference different population scenarios make. So I'm going to start with problem statement, of course, and then uh, illustrate the method a little bit and say a little bit about that. Uh, results, and so are there differences and what are those differences in resilience in a scenario when, when uh, we don't use uh, a universal access to family planning and reproductive health services as uh, one of the factors in that population scenario. And then conclusions and caveats, so a typical sort of model first uh, proof of concept or experiment. This work was funded by Population Action International. Roger Mark was involved in some of this, as was Kathleen Mogelgaard, who is here. I've been trying to figure out if there's somebody from uh, PAI here, but I can't see anybody. Anybody else? Okay, good. Uh, so, so the research question then is, does universal access to family planning services also improve people's resilience to climate change. So we have a lot of theory about this, and we have a lot of stories and narratives that show us that, uh, that, we, that universal access to, f to family planning services actually improves people's lives. Uh, we have smaller, healthier families, and so on. Um, so does that actually then sort of spill over into a resilience uh, to climate change and those impacts? We looked at seven countries. These are countries in which PAI is actively working. Uh, Bangladesh, Nepal, Haiti, Ethiopia, Kenya, M Malawi, and Uganda. We used population data from the usual source, the UN population scenarios. We actually uh, did all of the population scenarios from the UN, but I'm only going to show you what the, uh, the middle scenario uh, is like. And then a study by Scott Moreland and colleagues uh, who looked at countries in the world and said, well, what would the population actually be in the year 2050 if over time, between now and then, uh, the people who wanted family planning services, uh, the, the, if the documented needs in those countries for family planning were actually met, what would be the result? So those are the two data sources. We used a global change assessment model, which is a model that my organization has been working on for uh, more than two decades, um, and I'll say a little more about that. Uh, it's an integrated assessment model, tries to look at a whole, the whole problem. Um, and for, for this experiment, we were mainly taking the projections of economic growth in the world from, from GCAM. And then this vulnerability resilience indicators model which we have been using for the past probably dozen years to look at comparative assessments of uh, vulnerability and resilience in the world. So GCAM is a model that has 14 world regions. Um, it uh, couples an energy economic model with an agriculture and land use model, uh, and it looks at the, at the natural systems of the earth as well. Um, for, well, let's not get into that, but at, it, but at any rate, so it's, it's quite a complex model. It returns information on future energy and agricultural production, the economic growth of the world and where that growth occurs and how, how it happens. Uh, economics, so a lot about economics and a lot about land use. Also uh, has been used in many mitigation studies to look at energy technologies, so if you were actually serious about mitigation, how would you change the set of technologies that you use to uh, produce energy. Uh, we downscaled the economic results from the regions of the GCAM based on a country's uh, 
population within that area and also historic road rate, rates of economic growth. This is the, this is sort of a very simple uh, look at the vulnerability resilience indicators model. There are categories of resilience that we use. So communications, globalizations, economic capacity, food security, settlement and infrastructure, uh, human health, water resources, environmental capacity, human and civic resources, and ecosystem resilience. So a mix of environmental kinds of dimensions and social dimensions. And for each of those categories, then, there are some proxy variables. For example, for economic capacity, we use GDP per capita for a country. And coupled with that, the poverty headcount ratio, uh, uh, national poverty lines, and then agricultural raw materials, exports, and imports. So um, are you feeding your own people? Or do you have uh, surplus to export? Are you importing food? That, um, that economic issue. Um, let me see. So for human, human and civic resources on, on that side, uh, total dependency ratio, that is how many people are dependent on a wage earner in, uh, in a household, adult literacy, and percent women in secondary education. So this starts to get at what is the, what is the status of women within a country, and the percent of uh, seats held by women in international parliaments, another indication of the status of women in the country. So I won't go through all of these, but you get, you get the picture. It's a, it's a category of resilience, and then we use several proxy variables thinking through and documenting what that represents and our, uh, uh, what uh, dimension of resilience that represents. So. Results, these are the general results. Um, resilience to climate change was higher in all seven countries under the Universal Access to Family Planning, the UAFP scenario, in 2050. That's over the median projections of the UN uh, projection, over the median projections of the UN. The differences between scenarios were modest, so 2% to 10%, uh, with Uganda and Haiti experiencing the most improvement under that UAFP scenario. Um, and I'll talk about why we, th why we think that the, these results are so modest in a minute. In the areas of human health and civic resources, this is where we saw the largest increase under the UAFP scenario and uh, the most common. So all countries experienced a, a, a fairly big bump in that area, uh, up to more than 30%. Food security projections were more mixed based on the starting conditions in the country and rates of growth and uh, other aspects of resilience. So in Haiti, Kenya, Malawi, Malawi, and Uganda, food security worsened under the medium scenario, the UN scenario, but experienced positive increases under the UAFP scenario. Um, Ethiopia, slight increase in the medium scenario, more than three times as well as the U in the UAFP scenario. Bangladesh and Nepal, substantial gains under the median scenario, and then a slight uh, increase for Bangladesh under the UAFP scenario, but a, a more substantial gain for Nepal. So very mixed results, again. Um, but improvements in every country under the UAFP scenario. In all countries, environmental capacity worsened, um, and this seems to be pretty much a direct result of the number of people who are uh, in the country. Under all of the scenarios, you have more people in the country. And that uh, tends to, the, the theoretical representation is that puts more pressure on the environment. Uh, the, the countries uh, universally did not fare as poorly under the UAFP scenario, but still, there, that's n uh, negative across the board. We feel that these, these are first results, obviously. It's a proof of concept. It's something that we, we put together. Um, part of what it tells you is what you're missing, <laughs> what, uh, what refinements you can make, how you can go forward with that research. Uh, for example, the, uh, the UAFP scenario uh, is achieved over time. So by 2050, of course, the full effects of that program are not 
uh, fully realized. And so you have a, you have a gradual uh, meeting of that need, and that has uh, a shadow into the future, but it's not, not realized in 2050. Life expectancy uh, is unchanged across scenario projections. The UN doesn't, doesn't do it, and Moreland and his colleagues uh, followed that too. Uh, but it seems to us obvious that if our, our theory is true that uh, smaller families will be healthier families, then life expectancy will definitely be affected by this, as will labor productivity, which is uh, another thing that does not change uh, under the scenario. So uh, the problematic um, interconnections uh, we feel uh, contribute to an understating of uh, of improvements that might be seen in resiliency from universal access to family planning. And uh, that's the, the case for the VRIM, too. So for an indicator's model, typically there are uh, few, if any, theoretical justifications for weighting those uh, indicators or for providing uh, it in a numerical sense, in a mathematical sense, the interactions among them. And so the VRIM does not account for those, but of course they are there. <laughs> they are there in a society that, that chooses to uh, provide uh, reproductive health and family planning services. And so those are, those are not represented as well. So let's look at a, a few countries. These are, this is the whole set of them. Um, the, uh, you should note that the, the numbers on the side give you a so-called score, but the score is actually meaningless uh, since we are normalizing all the, all the ranges as we go and we have three time steps in there. So once you get to the second time step, the, the numbers themselves are meaningless. The comparisons are what you should look at. So this is how, this is the 2000 base year. Um, this is, uh, Nepal starts out obviously as as the uh, highest, and uh, Haiti the lowest. I'm sorry, Ethiopia the lowest. Um, and, but you can see the differences in uh, each individual category as well. Individual countries uh, chose chose three really based on what Roger Mark is going to uh, show us next in the programs, and uh, we'll see how how these things uh, dovetail if they do. Uh, this is Malawi, uh, 2000, 2005, so that's the, that's the base year. And then 2050 and the medium projection of the, of the UN projections. Um, so you see there's a, a, an increase, noticeable increase. And then uh, another noticeable increase uh, under the UAFP scenario. And then here is, here is the world. Right, so that's all the data that are there. So that's that's just another basis of comparison. So if you wanted to to say that uh, a country, for example, had aspirations to be a medium income country, which many of them do, um, that that would be that would be a good level to shoot for in terms of resilience. Uh, for Haiti, uh, you see there is. Just, just a very, very slight improvement in, under the uh, UN medium scenario, but uh, you know, more hefty improvement under the universal access to family planning scenario. And you can see differences among the various categories that are there. And this is Bangladesh. Um, with its starting position under the UN scenario. There's a meaningful difference there, and then not so much of a difference under the UAFP scenario. Um, and then the world, obviously, the, the world comparison again. So that's the kind of results that we have. I have uh, the full report and a summary report that are available if you want to uh, send me an email or uh, give me a card afterwards and uh, I'll be happy to send you uh, any amount of numbers that you want. <laughs> but I think this is an interesting exercise, not simply because it gives you sort of these gross comparisons, but then it enables you to ask the next set of questions. Where 
where is resilience principally located in a country? Where do things need to be worked on? Where do we need closer looks at uh, wh what things surprise us? And doesn't that require a, a closer look? Um, the other thing that it does is brings the, those strands of climate change research and population research together. And I think that's a good thing in itself. Um, if we look at resilience under climate change, we're taking a very narrow look at it. If we look at simply population scenarios and how they change, that's a pretty narrow look, too. But together, I think that it tells us something about development in general. Here's Ethiopia. Kenya. Uganda and Nepal. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much um, to the Wilson Center for having me here today and for convening this um, excellent panel. I, I actually want to start by sharing some words from uh, a number of the communities where we at Population Action International have been working. And, and most recently, um, a member of the local government unit, which is a local governance board in the Philippines at, at sort of the village level, said to me, you know, Roger Mark, this is not about numbers. This is not about you, Mr. Representative from an NGO. This is about us in our community and how do we develop governance structures that allow us to come together as a community and build resilience so that I can feed the children that I have. I just came back from Trinidad and Tobago last week working on a community-based adaptation project that's being sponsored by UNDP. And I was presenting on the role of population dynamics on community-based adaptation. And I was quite pleased to see in that particular workshop there were a number of my former economics professors from the University of the West Indies. And the head of the economics department at the University of the West Indies said to me, family planning, women's empowerment, resilience, climate change, who knew? I never thought about it. It was very interesting because he was surrounded by economists and he kept, Have, did you think about that? Have you ever thought about that? What an idea. And I actually was in Bangladesh when Sandy hit. And my colleagues in Bangladesh looked at me and said, you Americans, what's the big deal? In Bangladesh, we face the risks of super storms every day. We have to develop response mechanisms that allow us to deal with this and break the silence. So these are some of the stories that I'd like to share with you today to think about some of the ways my organization, Population Action International, is developing innovative responses to the social dimensions of climate resilience. And I'd like to talk about that from this perspective of some of the countries that um, I've mentioned. Because we are a family planning organization, our point of departure is that family planning is important and matters for building resilience to climate change. We know that through our work, we are um, implementing a number of projects, programs, approaches with partners that showing that innovation works. I'll share some examples with you from these countries. And I want to talk a little bit just about the momentum that we're building and how we hope to move this forward. <clears throat> 
So at PAI, we believe that if you want to respond to critical development issues like climate change, that you need to address the social dimensions of resilience. If you want to address climate change and you only look at mitigation, you're missing some of the important components. So that's why we have focused on adaptation and we focus on innovative social resiliency components of adaptation. We have been doing this at PAI for about five years. Um, we started in early uh, 2008, and at that time, we really helped develop a global awareness of what this work meant. How do, how do population dynamics fit in? What does the research tell us? How do uh, climate modelers look at these connections? How do we move beyond the rhetoric of saying women's empowerment matters? How do we quantify and demonstrate this? And how do we get that research recognized? And how do we develop qualitative research at the community level that helps us better understand how to respond? We were doing that internationally. We were participating in, in the uh, Conference of Parties meetings globally. And we came to recognize in order for us to have a real impact, we needed to move to the country level. So in the second phase of our work, we developed more of a country-focused approach, working with partners in country, giving small grants to help them develop innovative and new approaches that they designed, pilot tested, and advanced. And now we're focusing on those examples and moving that up to the policy level. So what does this mean for policy at a regional level, at a national level, at a subnational level, particularly with communities and local governing bodies? So this is, this is our approach to this work and this is how this work has developed over time at PAI. Interestingly enough, this approach has recently been uh, recognized by other funders, other agencies, other organizations. USAID, just in December of last year, released this new policy and program guidance on resilience that really looks at how you develop adaptive capacity and, and look at questions around risk reduction. Interestingly, right at the center of this approach and guidance are questions around governance and women's empowerment. So we recognize the centrality of this dimension of social resilience in overall development efforts. And it's recognized by others above and beyond a small NGO like, like my organization. We recognize that family planning is important. It's a human right. Um, it's recognized internationally. We recognize that it helps speed up the demographic transition, allowing for countries to benefit from a large, useful population, that it will slow population growth, allowing um, people to decide, couples to decide when they would like to have the children and how many children they can have in, a, in very much in a voluntary perspective that allows for investments in education and technology, providing opportunities for additional growth, enhanced development, and ultimately helping to build resilience and adaptive capacity. So this is a little bit of the theory and the approach be, behind our work. Let me share with you some examples of how, how this is being done, and I would say being led by our partners in countries where we work. They're really leading the way. We are helping to support their efforts. I'd like to start with, with Malawi and share with you some of the ways that we have brought these pieces together. We started by looking at the National Adaptation Programs of Action, the NAPAs, and found that in a country like Malawi, population is recognized as an important dimension of adaptation, but there's no funding that's provided for these kinds of initiatives. We started by funding a journalist's association against HIV AIDS. This is a journalist interviewing uh, a young community member to begin reporting on the ways that the community talks about these issues to really provide for policymakers a voice, a voice from the community, and to put that in the context of, of evidence. 
We also worked with the United Nations Population Fund, UNFPA, to develop a training module that linked population and climate change and trained a number of advocates and experts in Malawi to understand how these issues came together. And at the International COPS, the Conference of Parties, brought together many Malawian officials on the international arena to say, listen, this is important. If you're talking climate change policy, recognize the centrality of these issues. It's not going to cure everything, but it is part of resilience. We supplemented all of these uh, with some data and analysis. And looking, this, this um, shows population density in key vulnerable areas in Malawi. Ultimately, all of these efforts culminated in a collaboration with a group called AFIDEF, the African Institute for Development Policy, that worked with us to do a policy mapping of all of the existing policies, development policies, population policies, environment policies, to identify where the gaps were. We conducted a series of 50 in-depth interviews with policymakers and scientists and experts in Malawi and highlighted those results in a report, which we then presented to the vice president of Malawi, who also happens to be the Minister of Health. We presented to the Minister of Environment and Climate Change in Malawi, who happens to be a woman and who is a champion for gender. And through those avenues, we've gotten it up to the President of Malawi, who is also a woman and a reproductive health advocate. We have done this in collaboration with UNFP and UNDP. UNDP coordinates all of the resiliency efforts and work in Malawi. So this was a really good example of a policy window opening up where we brought these various elements together. And today, Malawi is currently redrafting its climate change policy and its population policy. And our partners are part of that drafting team and are working in these social dimensions to resilience in both these national policies. So a very exciting opportunity for us where we feel it's a little unusual because we had very close access to policymakers in Malawi, which is much more difficult for us in a Kenya, for example. So we were, we were quite pleased with where we are. So taking you now to sort of a super storm prone Bangladesh, and, and it was very interesting um, working at the community level with a number of, of partners. The, the, the image that you have here at the top left is actually um, um, uh, a union meeting, which is one of the, the local governing council, one of the most vulnerable areas. And we have brought them together to talk about the importance of addressing um, social dimensions of resilience when disasters strike. So they have done a mapping of the needs and have reached out to local policy makers who have then recognized that this is important to learn how to deal with disasters. Coming out of this, we had a member of parliament who has now introduced a parliamentary debate about the centrality of gender to climate change resilience in Bangladesh. So this is a real move forward in having sustained and informed dialogue on how these issues come together. We held a briefing on, these, on, on, on resilience and the social dimensions of resilience at the National Press Club um, in, in uh, Bangladesh, in Dhaka, and very, very well received. And at that meeting, we had Bangladesh's leading climate change negotiator recognize that, you know what, Bangladesh has an opportunity to be a world leader in demonstrating how and why it's important for, that we look at women and their role in climate change adaptation policies. And of course, we got some really good press that was highlighting these connections. So for us, that was an opportunity where we were working with policymakers at the national level and supplementing that work with advocates working at the local level and a beautiful opportunity for them to come together and, and support each other. Of course, I'm presenting the nice version. You know, there are lots of things that, that go on in the background that, that make this, makes this work difficult. But 
but interesting. The Philippines, another um, country that is very vulnerable, very much at risk. Many of you know that after 14 years of advocacy, there is now finally a reproductive health law that has been passed in the Philippines. And that law, the first image that you have here on the left, um, is actually a meeting with 45 Congress people and policymakers in the Philippines who are talking about what this law means for climate change and what are the opportunities that are being presented. Our partners in the Philippines, the Philippine Legislators Committee on Population and Development, whose chairman is the chief author of the reproductive health law, they have now produced a new film that connects reproductive health, population, and climate change adaptation. The state of the Philippines population report, which is produced every two years, was just released late last year and focuses on integrated population, health, and environment data analysis and programs and talks about those connections in terms of climate change and resilience and what it means for the Philippines. And for the first time in the Philippines, we have a local government unit that has enacted a population health and environment ordinance. And this is the ordinance that I mentioned earlier. So there are new and exciting developments happening in the Philippines at different levels. One of the exciting developments that, that I am most interested in thinking about is, is sort of getting to Laurie's point about agency and accountability. So we are working with partners called Fildroy. It's an association of about 45 different NGOs, and they're holding local government accountable by tracking their budgets and determining to which degree they're actually their actual budget line items for gender and development and for climate change adaptation and the degree to which they support and overlap each other. So very interesting. This we sort of have this um, you know full disclosure policy orientation that we do with, with, um, with local government units. But also, these boards that you see here are called transparency boards. So the level of the local government unit, they must, by law, put up all of their financial information for the community to inspect. Our NGO partner then goes and reviews those boards, explains them to the community, and helps the community advocate and push these um, government officials forward. It's difficult work because a lot of it involves them trying to understand the financial data and the processes and train their advocates to do so. There's a lot of mistrust, a lot of um, feedback that they get from the government units are, who are you to come here? I went to university and trained in this. You are just a little NGO. Where did you get this information? Who are you to tell me what to do? And documentation. A lot of the, the, the official paperwork is not filed. So actually tracking the budget allocations and being able to, to get definitive sense of what's happening with the budget is very difficult work. But I think, I think of this as being very innovative, very exciting, very cross-cutting, and really an opportunity to push this, this resiliency component. Um, and looking at that in terms of both gender and climate change adaptation. I've just returned from the Caribbean, participating in a, a UNDP program that's um, uh, supported by a, a small grant from the Global Environment Facility and uh, funded by the Australian government. And this is part of a, a broader program that's looking specifically at islands and their vulnerability. So SIDS, small island developing states, and looking at what can be learned at the community level and how can this be scaled up. It's a five-year program. It includes the Caribbean, Indian, Atlantic, and Pacific Islands. And you have a sense of some of the budget numbers. This is a community from Sans Souci, which is the, the first community in Trinidad and Tobago to receive a small grant to address this work. And this is um, a well-known climate scientist from Trinidad and Tobago, Roger Pulwati, who is part of the team that won the Nobel Prize um, for the work on climate change with Algo. And he is serving as an advisor. So you have local um, expertise guiding this kind of work. 
The main tool that is used here is a tool that's called a vulnerability reduction assessment, whereby a community is assessed in terms of their perceptions to their risk of climate change impacts, and then there, there's additional notations about what are the social dimensions of that and how will the community respond. Over the lifetime of the period, the, the, the assessment is meant to go down, and this is used as a tracking mechanism. So I was involved in this project, helping them think about the social dimensions. What was very interesting is, is the woman on, on the left, in the center, um, actually just happened. She's the head of the local um, steering committee in Trinidad and Tobago. And, and she also sits on the family planning board of Trinidad and Tobago and said that she had been trying to get them to recognize that family planning and climate change are linked and was excited to see that there are opportunities to do this in a real and meaningful way now. The map that you see here is a three-dimensional map that was developed for the island of Tobago that was done in conjunction with local communities. And they have recognized now, in addition to just looking at the topography that they need to look and factor in the social dimensions, not just in terms of vulnerability, but in terms of community cohesion and response mechanism. So there's a real progress in terms of looking at the methodology. What does it mean for participatory mapping? How does this translate to gender mainstreaming efforts? What does it mean for application across the Caribbean and other small island developing states? So an opportunity to recognize that particular vulnerability of islands. So moving forward, I'd like to conclude with this slide. Um, at PAI, we're continuing to build on this work. We are very much involved in the policies that are being formulated in Malawi. In Bangladesh, we are continuing to work at the local level and the International Community-Based Adaptation Conference uh, will be held in Bangladesh next month. And we will be there. We have organized a special track on social resilience and population dynamics. And it's the first time that you have the international community of community-based adaptation experts from all over the world coming together to have a, a, a discussion about that part of, of adaptation. And we will continue to build on that work in the Caribbean and continuing to build uh, partnerships with other groups that can help us position our work. So there you have it. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Roger, Mark, and uh, to the other panelists as well. well we, we've put a lot on the table here, and I'm sure that there are questions. Um, and uh, please uh, identify yourself when you raise your hand. Yes. Oh, yes, sorry, and wait for the microphone, please. Hi, my name is Libby Larson, and I'm a AAAS Science Policy Fellow working in the Earth Sciences Division at NASA. And um, I'm really interested in um, dissecting a little bit more of the differences between recovery and adaptation and, and the role that, that timescale has in that, because it seems to me that um, if, if, a, if a community um, dedicates themselves to recovering at a specific location, say whether or not it's Katrina or or the Jersey Shore, and and is interested in rebuilding in that exact location. Do we say that that is resilient, even if you know that means five years from now they're going to have to do that recovery all over again? And as a as an ecologist, I'm just I'm I'm really interested in trying to figure out how to um, couple the and incorporate the the social dimensions of this into understanding um, environmental change and climate change. So I don't know if you if any of you have any insight about that. Excellent question. Who wants to take that on? I think basically the only part I would talk, um, I would just agree with you that there's a big difference between recovery and resilience, and um, it takes a it takes a, a political will, it takes a lot of resources to truly, you know, make move move communities to safer places, for example, 
I know that uh, uh, FEMA has had a couple experimental projects along the Mississippi River where they've in fact removed entire communities. Um, and those, th those areas have already been hit again, and so they, they feel that they've actually recovered the money uh, just um, in a very few years that it took to do that. But you could imagine how difficult that would be. You look at New Orleans and the, the will to rebuild that city by people who live there and love there and, and have only, you know, have only, you know, very strong, for strong ties. Uh, that any, any, any discussion of, of not rebuilding there, as you recall, met a great deal of opposition. And um, so it, it's very difficult. But you're right, they're, wrong, they're, two, they're two very different things. If, go ahead, please. <laughs> Um, I would add, I just uh, worked on a project in uh, Australia on recovery from floods in Queensland, and it, the the same issues come up there. So if you um, are vulnerable to flooding, uh, what should you do? Uh, at, at some points, of course, it's probably worth your while to stay there again and again and maybe not again. You know, so the, the, at what point do you decide that it's economically worthwhile, it's worth the pain of relocation, and there is pain. It's not just a matter of buying out people and moving them. Uh, you're giving up um, attachment to place, you're giving up culture, you're giving up <coughs> uh, neighbors, you, you know, things that you've known. I think that was very strong in some parts of, of New Orleans. So, uh, you know, it, it, it's never a clear-cut decision, I would say, but I think, um, one thing we need to do more of is to look across a suite of possible scenarios going forward and saying, is this going to happen sometime? Then let's start preparing for it. I, I, I was going to just um, add on, on Liz's point to, to say that it, with this particular project in the Caribbean, they are, they are specifically learning from the experience in other vulnerable islands and sort of building on that. And one of the key components that they have decided to focus on is specifically how do you build resilience from the community perspective and what are the mechanisms in place. Um, and in doing that work, we had looked at various methodologies in terms of how do you do that on a real applicable level. And there was a very conscious decision not to do that in a disaster mitigation and recovery framework that that did not provide the response that they were looking for at the community level. So it was a really real and active discussion in that project. Yes. I, I'm actually responding oh. to that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so. Trish Clay, I work for the National Marine Fisheries Service. And I think another dimension of this is how important is the coastal location to what the people do. For instance, I work largely with fishermen and fishing communities, and you can't just say, well, you know, move to Iowa. <laughs> you know, they have to be within some reasonable distance of the coast in order to continue their livelihood. and. A lot of coastal areas, m most of the U.S. coast is really built up. So where do they go? Yes. Uh, Jean Boucher from um, Georgia Mason Sociology Department. I'm a student. Um, um, I was very happy to hear you talk about social justice and inequality, and um, I don't know if there's going to be an answer to this question. <clears throat> so we're dealing with levels of inequality in the U.S. now we haven't seen in 80 years, and uh, it seems to be like it was almost a concerted effort. I mean, it doesn't seem like it was sort of maybe an accident. Um, <laughs> so I'm just wondering, uh, when I hear um, think tanks and sort of tear apart and look at pieces of how how uh, the, the problems with inequality and the, the, it causes for all the things. I mean, how do we, and then you listen to the popular discussion about social class, about inequality, and it's, it's in another ideological, mythic plane. 
how, how do we start to tackle this? <laughs> I'm glad you said start to. Um, you know, you, you got to hope the pendulum, you know, at some point people get tired of the rhetoric and start, and start realizing what's behind it. Um, but, you know, they, they, then, so there's been such a concerted effort to, um, um, to, to um, blacken any, any, any uh, comments, to, to darken any ideas that have anything to do with equality. Because now we're talking about, you know, socialism and we're talking about, you know, all of the isms that are terrible, terrible, or, or, or we're, we are implying class warfare if we bring up even the fact that, that equality, inequality has grown so much. So, I, you know, you, you just don't know. You just hope that um, you see little signs of progress here and there. But um, when you realize the, the general public, how, how little they read, how little they keep up with these things, um, there was something, I think it was in the Huffington Post just this week about this, these issues that gave a lot of percentages about, about the beliefs Americans have, like climate change, you know, and, and, and all the things that, that it's just, I mean, what did it say, 20% believe in unicorns? <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, it, it, it can be very uh, dismaying. I, I, there isn't an answer, I don't think. Maybe, maybe students and young people and, you know, um, the future, but certainly not my generation is going to make any difference at this point. Well, can I just add, I, I think this is one more reason to, to care about inequality. Um, this is one more reason why inequality is bad for us as a society. And I think when you look at resilience, when you look at what's under the umbrella of resilience, it's many things that we care about. It's, it's women's empowerment, it's social equality, it's girls' education, it's uh, you know, reproductive health. Um, and I think this offers a framework, yet another set of reasons why these things are important to us individually and socially. I think it was Michael Harrington who said something to the effect that, um, that uh, we, we need to uh, care about this for a practical point of view, reason, if not the moral point of reason, that, that uh, life, our lives are not as good if you have lots of poor people and lots of crime and lots of you know, um, uh, people who are dysfunctional as far as society is concerned. We all suffer. So just from a practical point of view. Um, it, it needs to be tackled. And now we have another practical point of view, and that is the climate change issue. Uh, I think it's uh, worthwhile noting that uh, most people um, are very bad at being um, swayed by numbers and percentages, yeah. um, but are very much swayed by narratives. Mm -hmm. That's true. Like the, like the narratives that you have put up, and, like, and, and I think that is coming more to the fore as we, as we experience things like Sandy and, and um, other evidences, not only environmental but in other ways too, that we are an unequal society. Um, there are many strands in our culture, <laughs> and, but I think there's a strong uh, commitment uh, nationally to equality and that this is something that is that is now bubbling up and that will. Um, I don't think there's any uh, despair long term that needs, to, that needs to happen, but certainly we should all work for justice and equality. Yes. It's coming. It's good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Peter Adriance, I'm the representative for sustainable development in the U.S. Baha'i Office of Public Affairs. And I'm really interested in the, the topic of uh, resilience and the, the social dimensions. And I'm curious, in your travels and your research, if you have looked at the kinds of uh, institutions or organizations that may exist that are helping to build that social fabric of community life that is really critical. Um, in the beginning, I think, uh, Lori, that you uh, highlighted that case in Chicago where there was a community center and there was a pocket of that, that neighborhood that was, had very strong 
social fabric. Um, those kinds of things coming up, are they, are they coming up in your, your research? Are you finding that there are many examples of this? And what are some of the best ones? Uh, that's a great question, and by the way, I want to recommend a, a, that example was drawn from uh, Eric Kleinenberg's book, uh, Heat Wave, um, where he talks about this. And, and uh, maybe others have a better answer, but I, I think it can take many forms. Uh, in, in Chicago, in Auburn Gresham, it was, it was community groups. It was also what hadn't happened in that community. The community had not been, um, had not lost its urban center. I think that neighboring communities like Englewood um, had lost a lot of businesses, had lost density, um, and had sort of its, their social ties had been frayed in a way that they were not in Auburn Gresham. Um, the example of the Vietnamese community in, in New Orleans, it was, it was a religious organization. But this is a good question. Does it matter what the institutions are, or does it just matter that there are institutions? I think it's harder the more heterogeneity you have, you know, um, and we are a very diverse uh, country, and I think that uh, it makes it harder to 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 feel a sense of of commitment and sense of caring for those who are other than you. Um, you know, we're talking about in the Vietnamese community, community, and it's probably in the Chicago one. I'm not so sure, but probably we're talking about very uh, cultural binds. You know, people who were um, very much alike in their belief system. And of course, that's not our nation is full of pockets of that. But as a group, it's harder to convince people to be to be concerned about the inequality when they don't see faces that look like them. And uh, in another uh, set of research, um, I'm thinking particularly of uh, Putnam studies, um, both in the U.S. and originally in um, Italy. And the, the major finding there is that. Uh, communities and areas, so he was looking at the state level in Italy, for example, uh, the existence of multiple overlapping ties. So I'm joined to you by our, you know, we, we're in a bridge club together and you're also in a uh, soccer league with her and she and I uh, do something else and so we're all connected in multiple ways, not necessarily <laughs> in all ways, right? So we don't all go to the same church or we don't all uh, do this or that, but we have enough overlapping ties with everybody that we feel a sort of social responsibility. Um, in Italy, that was associated with not only good governance, but also with economic prosperity. So historically, over, uh, over a century or two, uh, those those areas were the most prosperous and were the most um, highly, also highly connected um, and well-governed areas of Italy. So we had, we uh, proposed at one point that uh, we should, in the spirit of, um, now I'm not gonna think of the name of this very famous landscape uh, person, but who said, uh, confront the object, but approach it obliquely. So you have a you have a object in the garden, but what you want to do is have paths that go to it in surprising ways. That uh, you ought to promote associations of of any type, whether they're sports or religious or games or whatever, um, in order to knit the community together in that in that precise way. Thank you. Sorry, if I could just add quickly, um, uh, Peter, there's a whole uh, body of, of research and initiatives around integrated population health and environment programs, PHE, and where, where um, even though these are not institutions themselves, what has been demonstrated from the research on these projects is that they are being very effective, these PHE programs, because they start very often with community leads. So for example, um, um, a number of conservation organizations have gone into communities with a conservation agenda and have very quickly been made to understand that that is not of interest 
to the community, that the community wanted public health interventions, for example. And once the conservation organization was prepared to think about how to meet the community needs over a period of time, that community would come around to addressing the conservation needs. So it was almost the approach and a governing structure that, that allowed for these initiatives to bring on more participants and to be more sustainable over time. There have been other studies that have looked at institutions, particularly with regard to disaster mitigation, and looking at the, the inability of those institutions to adapt to changing social realities. So there, for example, there's a World Bank study that has looked at disaster response institutions in Malawi and the inability of those institutions to address HIV AIDS and how that has actually impacted their, their ability to respond to disasters. So some of those studies are, are demonstrating that it's not so much the institution per se, but the governing structure and the culture that allows for it to be responsive. I'm going to use my moderator's privilege to <laughs> just respond to the point that Betty made about uh, homogeneity, which I think is, I, it, there are a lot of paradoxes in, in resilience, and this is one of them, that uh, homogeneity can be a good thing mm -hmm. in reinforcing social cohesion, but there's also such a thing as too much homogeneity. Mm -hmm. um, and th there's, a di there's a dynamism that comes with diversity that is that promotes resilience. Like, for example, the, um, Jared Diamond tells the story in Collapse of the, the Norse settlers in Greenland who had, it was very homogenous culture, they had a lot of social cohesion, but one of their cultural attributes was that they didn't eat fish. Mm -hmm. um, so they starved to death, ultimately. The, you know, their, their civilization was, was wiped out. Tons of cohesion, but, um, but uh, a, little more, a little more diversity, a little more dynamism mm -hmm. would have done it's them true. some good. Two sides of that. Mm -hmm. Kathleen? Thanks very much for a really interesting set of presentations. Um, I'm Kathleen Mogelgaard, and I just, um, I've got a question that builds off of your presentation, Liz. You mentioned how in the climate change community there's not been a lot of thought given to the kinds of population projections that are used, or certainly not a lot of thought to the kinds of social interventions that might have an effect on how population grows in the future, like family planning services. Um, and I wondered if you could comment a little bit on other, th the way that you see things evolving within the climate change community when it comes to the social dimensions of thinking about climate change adaptation and resilience. Are there other aspects of uh, social interventions that the climate change community is beginning to think about more in terms of how you build adaptive capacity and resilience that those of us in the reproductive health and family planning community could learn some lessons from on how we might be able to make stronger inroads within the climate change community for making the case for paying attention to this particular social dimension of what we see as an important part of building climate change resilience. It's really exciting to hear about some of the examples that Roger Mark talked about, but I have the sense that it's relatively small scale now, and um, I'm wondering if there are some lessons that we could learn about how other social dimensions of resilience are entering the climate change uh, dialogue and, and learn some lessons from that. Thanks. That's a really good question, Kathleen. <laughs> um, and I would say the the, uh, I hate to call them traditional since, you know, it hasn't been that long, but <laughs> uh, climate research community is struggling with these issues. Uh, I think the, the increasing focus on adaptation, vulnerability, um, and resilience is opening up those areas in that side of climate change research and that there are, but that the mitigation community uh, finds itself sort of stuck with an, uh, a set of tools that were developed that came from 
first a physical framing of the climate change problem and then a kind of uh, mechanistic and highly linear um, structure that allowed them to say, well, and then what are impacts going to be and, you know, and, and then uh, all the uncertainty that's around that um, makes so that when you actually get to what should you do in any location, the clouds of uncertainty are so large that it's that it's hard t for to make um, any kind of meaningful analysis, much less any kinds of uh, useful suggestions. Um, so that being said, uh, I think the new set of uh, emissions scenarios uh, allows some space. Uh, for more social societal characteristics and and there's a lot of lip service given to good governance nobody really knows what they're saying when they say that but and and that's myself included right <laughs> um, the but uh, the emission scenarios now are just just that they're a line of emissions um, and people from the impacts community, from adaptation, research, and so on, are being invited to say, well, what would a society that emitted at that level look like in all of its dimensions? Um, unfortunately, the, you know, most of the community that is doing this has, comes from that highly linear and um, sort of mechanistic uh, structure and is doing, doing that work in that way. But there is room for um, those of us who are interested in these other issues to create scenarios that will um, that will enrich what we know about the connection between energy use emissions and so on and how people live on the ground in households and in and making decisions about family planning and so on so not very optimistic but some room <laughs> and some change is going on <laughs> I, I'm Ethan Goffman from Sustainability Science Practice and Policy. Um, it seems like there's, you're talking about some kind of contradiction between um, stopping the long-term impacts and then mitigating, but it, it seems like lowering population, especially in a, a voluntary way, helps with both because smaller population means less emissions um, it also depends emissions per person but better family planning also means much more resilience and adapting right so and it seems to me like the two communities should be able to work together and there is a problem that the environmental community in the 1970s greatly exaggerated the population bomb mm -hmm. and therefore fears to speak up again um, and cre create opposition. But I'm, I'm just wondering if you could speak that it's kind of an, an artificial division and it seems both strands should work in harmony. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, used to have a, uh, an advisory board um, at at the lab where um, one of the participants was uh, Bob McNamara. And he uh, was very strong on saying that uh, population was the problem if we uh, simply um, slowed and then reversed the growth of population that, you know, our problems would be solved, what would be, you know, climate change and so on. Um, we always tried to convince him that it wasn't that simple and that you, you know, could imagine a world in which there were not very many people, but that they all had such large emissions profiles that uh, we wouldn't be mitigating climate change in the least. Um, and, you know, you could hmm, point to part of our world that's kind of like that. So, you know, one of the, one of the narrative stories for uh, growth in the world is that everyone will follow this path that, that uh, industrialized nations are on and that they will develop energy uh, resources and uh, people will have the benefits and certainly there are benefits of uh, electricity and other energy use um, 
and that's a world of higher emissions. You know, um, it, it, so it's not just numbers. It's more complex than that. And I think um, t any any time we look to one slice of this pie, um, a lot of the a lot of the people where I work look to technology, you know, to to solve the whole problem. And I, I think that's a pretty narrow view too. Um, but your major point, which is that <laughs> looking at this issue not just as an issue of adaptation, but also as an issue of uh, how, how we live in the world and how uh, we can live in a better world in the future is absolutely correct. I, I could just uh, briefly also add to that. You know, it's interesting for me because half of my career has been with environmental organizations. I've, you know, worked with World Resources Institute and the Sierra Club, in addition to working with uh, population organizations. And what, what I have found, and, and recent polling has emphasized this, that um, once you get to a question of framing around equity, women's empowerment, and resilience, that there is a lot more receptivity from the environmental community to, to bring these issues um, into their work. So um, those of us who work in this community try to get to that point where we can have a, a meaningful dialogue about what we really mean and, and move above and beyond the buzzwords that may provoke some of the reaction that you talk about from the environmental community. And just to add to that, there was some recent research uh, commissioned by uh, friends of UNFPA that, that uh, supported what Roger Mark just said. It, it showed, it was a poll of American environmentalists and it showed that um, population issues uh, a la carte did not have a huge amount of traction, but when you talked about population and consumption, uh, addressing the two together, um, that was something that 90% of American environmentalists supported. So, I'm sorry, you were going to ask. Um, I was also going to say, along some of those same lines, there's a lot of literature um, on community-based natural resources management, CBNRN, yeah, mm -hmm. which dovetails very much with yes. these, uh, and there are a lot of um, very nice, uh, I know in Malawi specifically, there are a lot of very nice programs going on, and some of them run by USAID as well. Um, and that's another source of literature for this kind of how do you combine all of these different things together and create local governance. Hi, I was wondering if you could speak at all um, to the nonprofit community. So, so some of what I see is um, corporate funding of the nonprofit community, and I've seen nonprofit after nonprofit sort of narrow their focus so they're about a specific country or they're about a specific problem that doesn't tread on anyone's toes. So, you know, Goldman Sachs will give a tiny bit of money, and then all of a sudden nobody's going to talk about the impact, um, first of all, of uh, the financial recession and the, I don't know, tens of millions of people thrown out of work all around the world um, and the billions that have suffered as a result of it. And no one's go going to talk about, about the importance of changing those regulations and those rules for the future, which might have more of an impact than anything else. So uh, is there an issue where where nonprofits are essentially being bought off and are, are providing these really limited um, solutions rather than speaking with integrity, speaking truth to power, addressing these major issues, and, and sort of you know coming to uh, um, a larger sort of value-based rhetoric that might be the start of a real movement, maybe globally, nationally, but on a, on a bigger scale. That's a good question. The, the, it does seem that in many cases the funding trends are going in exactly the opposite direction of what we now know is needed, which is a, a holistic, integrated approach, which is why uh, the USAID's new uh, resilience framework is so exciting, because it is that kind of holistic approach. Any other thoughts? <laughs> 
I, I would say thank you for, for raising the question. I do think it is a, a very important and fundamental yet very difficult question for for the nonprofit sector to, to think about. Um, some of the programming that I have spoken about earlier has been funded by agencies, by the corporate sector like Johnson & Johnson that has provided very meaningful corporate support that really has brought in the community. There are a number of, of initiatives internationally that I think um, focus on corporate accountability and try to get above and beyond greenwashing. One of them that is very much developmentally focused and, and has brought on a number of corporations is, is the work that has been done in Thailand around a program called Condoms and Cabbages that's supported by a gentleman called Michai Viridaya. Um, who is a Scottish Thai um, and has really, they do exist, and, and has really, um, diversity, has really found ways to ensure that any corporate engagement at the community level is meaningful. So he has put in place feedback accountability loops with the communities where they're able to demand specific services from a Coca-Cola um, in specific communities in Thailand. Um, so those there are some good examples. But, but I, I think you are getting to the crux of a matter in terms of credibility which really is the social capital that, that we have in the nonprofit sector. Um, we, we do have colleagues from the Sierra Club here in the room with us, and the Sierra Club does have a, a campaign that, uh, for example, is looking at how World Bank-funded projects dovetail with corporate funding for coal-fired power plants in a South Africa. Um, so there is a very vibrant advocacy um, groups in the nonprofit sector that are trying to disentangle um, a lot of the corporate connections. Um, and, and as you know, they're, they're well funded. And, and many of us in the nonprofit sector are, are much smaller than they are. So it is a question of, of um, the coalitions and the alliances and building that network to ensure that there's credibility and integrity um, from the work that's coming from the nonprofit sector, but I'd love to hear ideas from you too because it is it is a really vital issue. Yes. Thanks, uh, Keely Maxwell, Triple AS Fellow at the EPA. Um, so when we talk about community resilience, it tends to start to look like a laundry list of good community characteristics, right? Transparent mm -hmm. governance, healthcare and family planning, you know, strong social ties. But obviously, this is difficult to achieve, especially when there's the structural obstacles that we've been talking about. So, if you know you're a community leader or a community member, what are some concrete or tangible steps that you can take to try to promote disaster resilience in your community. And obviously this is very context and place specific, but what are some sort of, how can you get the most bang for your buck in terms of making some very, maybe small scale, but very tangible concrete changes? I would say planning and zoning would be my first. You know, if there's one thing that you, you know, if you're gonna have long-term change, it would be that. And I would would agree, and, and, and to sort of go back to the question that you also raised earlier, um, community perception of risk, and, and sort of how do you measure progress? A lot of the communities that where we were working in the Caribbean, up to 70% of those communities that are on the coast don't even know what climate change is. Some of the partners that we work with in Malawi, in local languages, there isn't even a term in the local language for climate change. So there's some real barriers in terms of sort of just understanding. So how do you dovetail those kinds of initiatives with, with community understanding and measure progress in a real and meaningful way? And I would add that that's not only the case in developing countries, nor is it uh, only the case among 
people who are living out there and, and are affected. We um, worked with a master's student at University of Maryland last year to, uh, to survey natural resource managers um, on the eastern shore in Maryland um, and asked to ask them, you know, how were they incorporating climate change uh, uh, concerns in their work. And the answer was very minimally, mostly. I wanted to uh, take a moment. We have a, a late-breaking bulletin from the field, actually. We uh, received by, by email a note from uh, Blue Ventures, which is a, a PHE organization working in southwest Madagascar. Um, and uh, they were recently hit by Tropical Cyclone Haruna, a powerful Category 2 storm on February 22nd with devastating impacts on the remote villages in the area where we work. Um, but they write, thanks to our existing PHE program and strong local infrastructure, Blue Ventures has been able to quickly mobilize our well-established network of community-based distributors to reach these extremely isolated and vulnerable communities, home to some 15,000 people, who would otherwise be completely cut off from support following the cyclone. In the short term, we're providing them with vital health information and supplies, including water purifying solution, diarrhea treatment kits, and insecticide-treated mosquito nets. In the long term, we're going to be focusing on strengthening our community health work in order to sustainably increase community resilience to natural disasters. So this experience is really highlighting to us the huge and perhaps unexpected benefits of working in a holistic way and building capacity at the community level. That's how it works. <laughs> <laughs> Other thoughts, questions, final words from panelists? Just thank you for this. This has been very interesting yes, and worthwhile. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>